On the 3rd of February 1999, a young man by the name of Joseph Bello was walking along the Oshodi Isolo flyover very early in the morning on his way from a ninth vigil. And I think the fact that he was coming back from church was what played a role in the incident that was about to unfold. You see, while Joseph was walking along the flyover, he was singing. He was singing a church song to himself, you know, just being in the spirit. And as he walked past the flyover towards the steep end, he began to hear someone sing along with him. It's not clear if the person was singing the same song as he was, but it was said that he heard someone singing. And so he had to stop singing to listen to where the voice was coming from. It was a female voice he was sure of. But it was odd because no one around him was singing. In fact, there was barely anyone around him. So who was singing and where is this voice coming from? After a few moments, he realized that the voice was coming from under the flyover. At first, he thought it was very odd that a woman was singing under the flyover. So the effect of the crying voice and the singing kind of got to him and pushed him to go down the flyover to take a look at who was singing or where the sound was coming from. Now, it's unclear what was running in his head because the flyover itself was already notorious, especially under the flyover itself, was already known to harbor a certain insane looking man by the name of Clifford Orgy. So many people knew that Clifford Orgy, the madman, lived under the flyover because he always hung around the flyover. He was already terrorizing people around the flyover. So it is possible that Joseph Bello already knew that uh, a madman lived under the flyover. And I guess that may have played a role into his curiosity as to why is a woman's voice, why is a woman crying from underneath the flyover where the madman Clifford Orgy stays. When he got down to go take a look to know where the voice was coming from, it was said that he first perceived a burning stench of human flesh, that it was horrible, but you know, he still needed to know what's happening. As he began to move closer, he saw a shelter built out of car tires and then he noticed that fire was burning from inside the car tire almost like something was cooking and that curiosity in him did not exactly stop because he kept on going to see where the voice was coming from and what's up with the fire and the smell. Like At this point, it was almost like he just wanted to just see something to know what was happening. When he got into the shelter made out of tires, he looked into it, he peeped into it and noticed that the limbs of a human being was being roasted in a fire. He said he saw a human hand and a human leg being roasted in a fire. Inside the shelter, he nearly threw up. In fact, he said he almost threw up and had to run back up, alerted some people who were already passing by to come and see what he had just seen. And just like that, more people came down to the flyover, underneath the flyover, to see what this young man, Joseph Bello, is saying that he had seen. At this point, Clifford Oji himself wasn't even in his conclave. He was not there. It was almost like he had gone to probably buy spice or taking a stroll around the flyover to find leave, whatever it was, or maybe he had even gone to the toilet. But before Clifford could come back to his conclave, before he could come back to his kitchen where he was cooking his breakfast, he realized that there was a crowd of people there looking into his shelter. And at this point, from the distance where he spotted this group of people scattering his shelter, he ran. But, you know, he couldn't run very far because they chased him and dragged him back and begun scattering everything he had built underneath that flyover. It was at this point they saw human remains, human parts, other parts that had been cooked, bones, decaying body flesh. And at this time, more people had gathered. It was a whole crowd of people around the flyover. I mean, he was already famous. People already knew him. People knew that, you know, this man is insane. Some people saw him as insane. So people, he was quite famous for chasing people around, acting like a madman. So people already knew him from selling razor blade at the market back in the day. So when the discovery of human body parts were found in his conclave, you know, it's a whole different story. It's a whole nother entire story on its own. So people were like shocked, but almost not surprised because while this discovery was being made, a lot of people were recalling times that they had passed around there and had perceived the burning flesh and 
whenever they try to go and look, he would chase them. Some people even say that they saw him or they always see him eat meat and they never just knew that those meat he ate were human meat. So when Clifford Oji was dragged back to his conclave, he was beaten as it was said and the conclave was destroyed. It was in the process of destroying all the tires that he had used to build his shackle that they discovered a smallish, skinny, emaciated woman by the name of Awuwa Lawal. Now, it was said that Awuwa Lawal was the woman who was singing that attracted Joseph Bello, who was passing by on his way home. So, when they destroyed the, the shackles, they realized that this woman had been squeezed and compressed into a tire space. She was very smallish and had lost a lot of weight and was in horrible condition but she was still alive. Some people believe that she was the one that was going to be fed on next by the cannibal himself, Clifford Oji. But luckily for her, she was rushed to the hospital. Unfortunately still, it was said that uh, Awuwa Lawal died a few days after, like many more days after, she slipped into coma and did not come out from it. But back to that same day on the third when this discovery was made, after they had scattered um, Clifford's kitchen and destroyed everything, Clifford had a neighbor, like another homeless man who nothing much was said about him. And it's not clear if this man also played mad, but the man was also homeless and lived under the flyover, but a little far from Clifford. I guess maybe that was where Clifford was coming from when, you know, the men had already attacked his own kitchen and they chased him. So they went to that man's own shelter and destroyed it because they figured that since he was a neighbor of Clifford, he might as well be involved because there's no way Clifford would be killing and eating human beings and somebody who just lived a few feet away wouldn't know or be involved. When they went to that man's shelter, whose name is known to be Tahiru Aliu, they destroyed it and they found a hole about four meters deep and they realized that this hole was where uh, his victims or their victims were kept before they were eventually killed and cooked for dinner. And immediately Clifford and Tahiru were arrested. But the biggest mystery behind the Clifford Oji story is not even the fact that he killed and ate people for a living. I mean, that is a given. But when the police did a thorough search and uh, were carrying out their investigation, they saw a few things that was odd. They found a check of 80,000 Naira and they also found a GSM mobile phone. Now, some of you might be wondering, how is an 80,000 Naira check and a mobile phone weird? See, even if it is even weirder, it's the mobile phone itself because this was 1999. Mobile phone was not publicly available in Nigeria until 2000. Some sources would even say 2001. So, the public did not even have hands on mobile phone. People who had access to mobile phones at that time in 1999 were wealthy, rich, powerful politicians. Like you had to be very wealthy to be able to get your own mobile phone. Mobile phone were a thing of class. That is how you knew who was wealthy and who wasn't wealthy. So for them to see such a valuable, expensive gadget in Clifford Orgy's possession, it made the whole story change its tone. It was almost like the police figured out that with the discovery of the check and the mobile phone, they realized that they were dealing with more than just a cannibal. It turned out that they might be dealing with more than just one person or more than just two people. Because how did this man get a mobile phone? How did an homeless man who lives under the bridge get a GSM phone at the time when only Obasanjo had it? How did he get it? And who wrote the check of 80,000 Naira to him? Now, 80,000 Naira was a big deal then in 1999. So, let's be clear, 80,000 Naira then was a big deal. So, to explain the existence of the check of 80,000 Naira and the mobile phone in the conclave of this cannibal flesh eater, it was almost clear that rich and powerful people came to visit him. It was almost clear that wealthy politicians who had power and money and influence came down under that bridge to see Clifford Oji. Clifford Oji himself said that, yes, rich and wealthy people came to see him and they were the ones who 
gave him those gifts and those money and the mobile phone. But what for? Why were these rich and powerful men coming to see a homeless man living under the flyover? Why? Like, what was the reason? What did these wealthy politicians need from this man? Like, why were they coming to see Clifford Orgy? Why were they giving him so much gifts, so much money, so much valuables? Why were they giving him that now? Before I explain why, let me tell you another thing that was discovered in the search of the victims that Clifford Oji had killed in the past. One of the few things that was found in Clifford Oji's conclave and around the flyover were remains of people, body parts, dead people, decaying remains, severed hands, legs, limbs, just numerous body parts. Some remains were dug out around the flyover site and they were brought out for the people to see. And the police noticed that there was something about all of these remains. One body part that they did not see in consistent with the other body parts was the head of these victims, the skulls. Even the body part that had decayed and turned into bones, they couldn't find the skull. They couldn't find the head attached to the bodies of all of these discoveries. They saw hands, legs, and basically every single other body part, but they didn't see heads. Although, although some sources said that there was a particular human head that was found, but it was fresh, and it was that human head that was only identified to be a woman named Eno, who was an acquired bomb trader. I don't know how she got there, but it was said that that was the only victim that was identified, which kind of makes Clifford Orgy killing spree a little difficult because all his victims were not identified, apart from the uh, Awuwa Lawal who was saved but eventually died in the hospital and Eno whose head was recently just severed from her body at the time Clifford's conclave was uh, ransacked. So the human head that they only found was that of Eno. But the other body parts, the ones that had decayed, the ones that had turned into bones, did not have heads. So where did the heads go? What happened to the heads? It's not as if he ate the head. So where are the heads of these victims? Where are the skulls of these victims? What did Clifford Orgy do with them? And with this, it's not difficult to connect the dots with the 80,000 Naira check, a mobile phone and other unseen gifts. And then the fact that Clifford himself said that rich and powerful politicians came to visit him, came to see him in his conclave. So what were they giving him this gift for? Why were they giving him the check for 80,000 Naira? Why were they giving him a mobile phone as a gift? What did these rich and powerful people come to do in Clifford Orgy's dungeon? What did they come there to take in exchange for the money that they gave to him? What would a politician have wanted from Clifford Orgy that would warrant them to give him 80,000 Naira check and a mobile phone? What would it be? <gasps> I know, the heads of the victims. That was where the heads were going to. The heads of these victims were clearly being bought by rich and powerful politicians. Notable men in high powers were coming to patronize Clifford Orgy for human heads. That was why his victims never had heads. Even when they dig up bodies from the ground around the area, no human head, no skull. So where did the skull go to? Yes, they went to the politicians who came to patronize him. But unfortunately, they couldn't trace anyone to Clifford Oji. No one was attached to Clifford Oji apart from Tahiru Ali. They were the only two people involved in this cannibal scandal. So what about the check written? I would think if the police found that check, they would be able to find whoever came to patronize him. I don't know why they didn't follow that lead. And I also don't know how checks were in the 90s, but I would think the name of the person who owns the check or who wrote the check would be on the check. At least his account number would be on the check to the point where the police could trace it to find whoever was involved with Clifford Oji in terms of buying human heads and human skull. But you know, nothing was said regarding the people who patronized Clifford Oji, so it was difficult to ascertain for a fact that politicians actually did come to you know patronize him for human head. However, people think and people reason and that was the only way they could connect the dot from this madman having checks worth a fortune and mobile phones worth fortunes in connection to the fact that his victims did not have a head attached to them at the time 
they were found. The next part of this story we are going to look into is how did Clifford find his victims and how did all of this begin? You know, Clifford made a confession that the people who patronized him, he sold organs to them and body parts to them. And he also mentioned that he started in 1992, he and Tahiru. Uh, yeah, he and uh, Tahiru started the kidnapping and killing and cannibalism in 1992. Remember, they were caught in 1999. This is almost about seven to eight years span. So, how did it start? And um, you know, how did they find their victims? So, first of all, I'm going to tell you the story of what is being said regarding how uh, Clifford Oji found his victims. And then I will also tell you my own thoughts, what I think and what I feel might have been, you know, how it all started. So, according to what was discovered, a lot of people said that Clifford used to sell razor blades at the time. So it was before 1992, I guess, somewhere in the market. You know, this guy's from Enugu, so he came to Lagos to make a living. And then he started selling things in the market, razor blades. And those things weren't successful. All of a sudden, he moved under the bridge, you know, started acting mad. The thing is, it's unclear, but some people believe that he may have lured and deceived a lot of people by posing to be someone who had some kind of spiritual powers to give answers to people or to help people become very rich. However, to some people, he was a madman. In fact, to a lot of people, he was a madman because whenever he was above the bridge or around the bridge, he was always chasing people with sticks, laughing, running naked, acting mad. So to a group of people, Clifford Oji was mad. And that was why he was ignored most of the time. That was why whenever people perceived the stench coming from his area, they just, uh, he's a madman, just leave him alone. However, to a little group of people, Clifford posed as someone who had some kind of spiritual powers. I would think the people he posed for were the rich men who came to patronize him, but I doubt. I will give you my own opinion in a short while. You see, the people who Clifford posed to, the people who Clifford lured into his dungeon to kill were the people he had told that he could help them achieve great things spiritually, he, he could give them spiritual answers, he could find their, the root of their problem. One of those people would tell you that uh, it's coming from your family, the root of your problem is coming from your great-grandfather. So he deceived a low class of people. The certain kind of people he targeted were the equally poor people like him, people who were homeless, people who he knew the family would not come to look for, people who did not have money, people who did not have power. Those were the people who would clearly need his help, clearly, obviously. I don't think any politician would leave their, their, their powerful wealth to come and meet him to find answers, no. Clifford's shamanness, Clifford's uh, spirituality uh, posing was used to love people who wanted some kind of powers, who wanted their life to be better. And when these people come to his conclave, Tahiru would be the one to attack them physically, ending up killing their victims and eating them up. So that was how he lured his victims. There were people he posed for as mad people, you know, there were people who saw him as mad and there were people who saw him as someone who had spiritual answers and spiritual powers in his conclave. And those were the people he targeted and killed. The people who would come to him with the hopes of doing rituals or the people who would come to him with hopes of finding answers to their lives because they've been deceived by this man that he had some kind of spiritual powers. I mean, it wasn't like he drove a van and started kidnapping people from, you know, schools or anywhere. So many people believe that that was how he lured his victims to his conclave. He would tell them to come, give them answers and eventually kill them and eat them. Now, my thing is, when did this start and how did it start? Was Clifford Oji a cannibal? Because he had admitted selling organs to wealthy people and body parts to wealthy people. Was he a cannibal before he became an organ seller? Or was he already a body part dealer before he became a cannibal? How did this man begin? What started it? Because if he claimed that he started eating human beings with Rabiu in 1992, what was his life like before 1992? What did he eat? And even if he ate human beings, how did he find them? Because I was sure he had a life. I was sure he had a family. I'm sure he grew up in a community. So what was his life like? And how did it go from that to this cannibal under a flyover eating human beings and dealing with body parts and selling them to politicians? This is my guess and this is what I think.
I think Clifford Orgy started off as a body parts dealer. I feel that when he was selling his razor blade, his business wasn't moving. And so when he became, you know, when he started living under the flyover and act, began acting mad, I am very sure that a politician or a few politicians or a few powerful men or a few people had come to meet him, promising him a better life if he could find human parts for them. And I think that was how it started. I feel like the deal to find the body parts or the organs was what begun all of this. And so maybe he did it the first time and it was successful and he got paid and decided to continue. And along the line, he realized that, you know, instead of killing these people, cutting out their organs and burying them, why not eat them? And I guess that is where or how he started eating human flesh because when he was interviewed he said that he couldn't stop that he doesn't see a difference between a human meat and that of a goat's meat or that of an animal meat to him these two taste exactly the same maybe he had a history of eating human meat in the past but for this situation I feel like the offer was brought to him to start dealing with human parts in exchange for money and in the bid to conceal this victim's body, in a bid to conceal or hide his victim's body, he clearly doesn't have a compound where he would bury them all. So, because I know that serial killers or killers or people who kill, they would have to find a way to dispose of their bodies, uh, of the bodies of their victims. Some people bury the bodies, some throw away the bodies, some um, hide the bodies, some soak the bodies in acid but the thing is when you kill someone as a serial killer you would want to get rid of the body and i think that was the case for clifford og he needed a way to get rid of the body that would suit his lifestyle he doesn't have a compound he doesn't have a big house where he could dig a hole in his backyard to bury there he's living under a flyover there isn't almost enough land in a flyover for him to be able to bury all his victims from 1992 down to 1999 yes so for him the eating of his victim's flesh was a way of getting rid of their body after doing the major thing he wanted to do. The main thing he wanted to do to his victims was get their body parts and organs and head and sell them to politicians. The fact that he ate them afterwards was secondary, it was the next thing. It wasn't the major reasons. I don't think he was killing them for the purpose of eating them because then he would have really started killing from a very long time ago i feel that this man was actually being used by politicians powerful people i feel like he was being used by notable people or ritualists to get these body parts in exchange for money and uh, prizes and gifts so for his own personal gain just so that his victims doesn't waste since he knows how to cook human meat he just decided to eat them you know after all there isn't enough burial ground to put all of their bodies so what would he do with the body parts after the head and the organs have been taken away? Is he going to keep burying them all over the place? I mean, one day they would definitely catch him if he's burying someone. So I just think the cannibalism for Clifford OG is uh, secondary. And to make it really more believable that politicians were behind this man, he never got tried for his crimes. He was taken to Kirikiri prison and was there and he never got to face the law. Eventually, in 2012, it was said that he died in prison, even though many people believe that he didn't die and that the people or the politicians who he had helped with this body part were the ones who stopped him from going to court because if he went to court, they might be exposed. So that is it. It was said that Clifford died in 2012 in a prison after suffering some kind of mental health called psychosis and um, it was also said that nobody came to claim his body not even a family or a relation his body was unclaimed by anyone who knew him up to this day so guys that is the sad story of nigerians first cannibal clifford og i made a video regarding um serial killers top 10 serial killers in africa and many people especially nigerians wanted me to include Clifford OG as a list uh, in, in the list of serial killers and I, I understood that he was an option honestly to be considered but then I realized that for Clifford OG his own case was bigger than just a serial killer like he had so much going on in his own tragic bizarre weird lifestyle that I felt was deserving of its own individual video and did not suit 
in the list of serial killers which is why i'm making this video dedicating it to clifford orgy the first known nigerian cannibal and you know here we are it's but i just strongly believe that someone gave him that offer and from then he started killing people for the main purpose of selling their body parts and only just started eating the the remains as a means of getting rid of their body don't forget to like this video and also don't forget to subscribe to my channel i appreciate all your love and i hope you keep staying subscribed turn on the notification button so whenever there is a new video you will be the first to know